Okay, uh, good morning, thanks for coming. I'll tell you about my work with Peter Branden on certain class of polynomials. So, so my initial training is in algebraic geometry, so I'll, let me just very briefly tell you where I'm coming from. Of course, in the end, what I'm going to tell you about is, has nothing to do with algebraic geometry. It's essentially a multi multivariable calculus. But uh, this is how I think about these objects. So, I mean, algebra algebraic geometry think about these guys, these projective variety. These are varieties living in projective spaces. And one thing you can do with them is to, when, whenever you're given such y in Pn, you can sort of use the fact that it lives in Pn to measure the volume of y. But of course, this is not nothing, uh, not an intrinsic process. It really uses the metric on Pn. So you should really think of it as a volume of this pair y inside pn. And another thing that geometers usually do is to exploit this additional structure on the set of all possible embeddings from y into pn. There are many, many different ways of putting your y into some pn with varying, p varying n's. And one of the very basic structure of the set of all such is the fact, fact that the, the set forms a convex cone. So this is what we call the ample cone of y. And the basic observation is that you can formally add two projective embeddings and get another projective embedding. This is just another way of saying the fact that the product of two projective spaces can be embedded in a pro projective space in a standard way. And we are formalizing that structure to collect all such embeddings to form an ample cone of y. But if you look at the set of all such embeddings in this pictorial way, then the Hodge theory of y, this abstract variety y, tells you that this quantity as a function on the ample cone is actually a very special function. So the Hodge theory of y says that, among other things, This function volume is a polynomial function on the space where ample cone lives in. And not just a polynomial, the one that becomes concave function after taking log. Uh, it's a space of divisors modulo certain equivalence. So you can think of it as a subspace of h upper 2 of y. Vector space. Vector space. So think of a finite dimensional real vector space, say. Sorry, everything is over the real number? Yes, let's, let's, yeah, let's say. Yeah. Not log concave on everywhere, but on the ample cone. So. To be really technically correct and consistent with what I'm going to tell you is that I'm simplifying the situation a little bit. So this ample cone can be a very complicated cone. In particular, it need not be polyhedral. But uh, let me try to remedy that non-finiteness just, just by choosing, say, some reference ample classes. So 
maybe. And just look at the convex cone spanned by those chosen n ample classes, arbitrary of them. And the polynomial function that I'm talking about is simply this function. where this d is the dimension of y, and the symbols w stands for my variables of the polynomial, and this dth power is happening inside the cohomology ring of y. So I'm taking the intersection product of these hyperplane classes, and then I get a number depending on the given w's. And the claim is that this is a polynomial in w's that has special properties on this cone. That's a homogeneous That's right. It is homogeneous of degree d in n variables where n can be any number. So the edges are just uh, particular embeddings. That's right. Think of particular possibly different embeddings of y. So how do you interpret them as coefficients of a polynomial eventually? I mean, you, you That's right. So these are just uh, abstract classes, say a cohomology class. But I can multiply cohomology classes. But, and if I multiply them right number of times, in the end I'll get a number. So given w, this is a number. So called the self-intersection number of this. Uh, see what? Uh, it, yeah, there are there are many. But, uh, maybe we'll see at some point. Yes. Oh, I, I'm just trying to tell you where I'm coming from. But uh, okay, that's what it is. But uh, the next question that is completely natural to geometers is to take the limit. So. A large part of modern geometry is devoted to the study of such embeddings, well, depending on one of these H's, and see what happens if H approaches the boundary of this ample cone, where it will no longer be ample. Then usually what happens is that it still defines a map to some projective space that is no longer an embedding. And a large number of very interesting possibilities can happen. This is the, like a very basic formulation of the modern birational geometry. So what I am interested in is what happens to this polynomial if I drag each one of these HIs to the boundary of the ample cone? And what kind of polynomials do I get? So that was my initial motivation. So so it turns out that the kind of polynomials that you get in the limit in that sense has fascinating properties and this is what I call Lorentzia polynomials I'm going to define these in down terms very soon But apart from the geometric motivation, what, and sort of quite surprising for me from this beginning, was the fact that these Lorentzian polynomials very smoothly links uh, two different notions of convexity. So okay, uh, again, I'm going to make sense of this statement at some point. So, so it, there is a, this usual notion of continuous convexity, so convexity of continuous functions, but there is also 
discrete notion of convexity that algorithmic people were <coughs> interested in for various reasons. And the, the theory of Lorentzian polynomial sort of interpolates between this theory and that theory. So roughly, uh, the connection that I'm talking about is this. So, I mean, we all love polynomials. And the polynomials are special kind of functions. But it can be viewed as a function in two different ways. So one is the usual way, and it belongs to this world. So say if you have a polynomial in n variables, then of course it's a, it's a function. You can think of it as a function from, say, Rn to R. You just evaluate the variables. And that's the one way. But you can also think of it as a discrete function with finite support. So this time, you can think of polynomial as a function with a domain n to the n, again having values in R, where the function is almost everywhere 0, and the value of the function is the coefficient of the corresponding monomial. So this is coefficients. Where I'm identifying the domain with the set of all monomials in n variables. And anybody who loves polynomial have wondered, right, how is this function related to this function? At least the convex analytic point of view, there is a very pretty connection that I'm going to explain. So, let me <coughs> introduce, set up some basic notation. So, I'm going to write H D N for the space of homogeneous polynomials. of degree d in n variables. Say, with real coefficients. So this is a finite dimensional real vector space that I'll work with. And inside that space, I'm going to define a special open subset in case when d equals 2 to start with. So that is my L not 2 n. And it is an open subset of the space of quadratic forms. So this will be the set of quadratic forms. With positive coefficients. And by that, I mean all the coefficients are positive. So zero coefficient is not allowed. Every one of them is positive. And I want these to have a particular signature that I call Lorentzian. That is, one positive eigenvalue and all the others strictly negative. So in particular, I want the quadratic forms to be non-singular. So this description makes it clear why this is an open subset. And it lives inside, of course, H2n. And then I'm going to define L0 of dn for d larger than 2. This will be a subset of hdn with a property that d 
the ith partial derivative of f belongs to l naught d minus 1 n for all i. So this is the symbol that I'm going to use for the partial derivative with respect to i variable among the n variables. And the requirement is this. I mean, you can think of this as a recursive definition, but it, it is really not. I mean, it's a very simple condition. So how do you check that your f is in here? You check that every one of the partial derivatives is in the space. But how do you check that? You take the partial derivative again, again, again. And in the end, you arrive at quadratic forms. So really, the condition is that your polynomial has all positive coefficients, then any one of the quadratic forms that you can get by taking partial derivative have this signature. Maybe I'll mention it, yeah. So Yeah, that's necessary, right? If if you want to have this property. And if you already know what hyperbolic polynomials are, for example, stable polynomials, then you I mean, sort of immediately see that uh, this set contains strictly stable polynomials. In particular, its closure will contain all the stable polynomials. And uh, of course, this was not the motivation for my collaborator, Patrick Branden. To him, this whole theory was an extension of the well-developed theory of stable polynomials, which is which is fascinating, but it has its limitations. In a sense, it's too restrictive, and it doesn't really apply to some natural examples. So his desire was to find a natural class which enlarges the space of stable polynomials, which sort of remedies its uh, restrictions. So polynomial satisfying this condition, I'm going to call it strictly Lorentzian. So this is the set of strictly Lorentzian polynomials. And clearly it's an open subset of HDN. So I, I, I like to picture things inside the projective space. So whenever I write P in front of a space, I mean the projective space, real projective space. So inside this real projective space, I've just uh, singled out some particular open subset. that maybe I'm going to write this set by P of L naught dn. I have drawn it in a curvy way just to emphasize the fact that this L is not in any sense convex. And that's where the most interesting structure comes in. So if you think of this as sort of a convex analysis, the, maybe the basic feature that you would expect is the if you add two convex functions, you get convex function. Well, that is generally true here. It is no longer true here. And essentially, by the same reason, it's no longer true here. So you, get, you, can, you cannot just add two arbitrary Lorentzian polynomials to get another Lorentzian polynomials. But sometimes you can, just like stable polynomials. And, and essentially, this is a combinatorial condition. That, that has many different fascinating descriptions. So, and then what I'm going to do is simply, let me write it here, define the closure of L naught dn to be the space of Lorentzian polynomials.
So that's our definition. So in this picture, I'm just looking at this closure. So what kind of polynomials live on the boundary? Well, that's somewhat analogous to the question that I posed in the first blackboard. There are some obvious conditions. So in the interior, I have required that all the coefficients are positive. So in the boundary, all the coefficients are non-negative. And also in the interior, I have required that for every one of the quadratic forms that you can get, you should have the Lorentzian signature. So in the boundary, the condition that you get is that the quadratic form has at most one positive eigenvalue. It can achieve lots of zero eigenvalues, that's fine. But it cannot have two or three or more positive eigenvalues. But of course, those are necessary but not sufficient. So here's a non-example of a Lorentzian polynomial. So think of, say, cubic form in two variables, like that. So it has all non-negative coefficients. And what are its partial derivatives? I mean, they are completely fine. In particular, each one of the partial derivatives is Lorentzian. But the original polynomial itself, it's an interesting exercise to think about the fact that this is actually not Lorentzian. So you can approximate each one of the partial derivatives, but not the original polynomial. So this guy lives somewhere far out here, which is So the claim is that this is not in the closure. So you can never, you can, there is no way. Huh? Why isn't it in the interior? <laughs> well, it has some zero coefficients. So, and the point is that you can, maybe you can add a little bit of a, like a positive multiple of, but those will ruin the signature condition. So that's the claim. So, what kind of other conditions that you need to describe the boundary. So, so that's the first place, but not the last place, where this discrete convex analysis comes in. So I'm not going to really give you a full introduction to the theory, but there, there is this book by Kazuo Murata, which I like. And in a sense, this whole book is devoted to the justification of the theory that I'm going to very briefly introduce, is what, th why that is really the proper discrete analog of the usual convexity theory. So it's a wonderful book. I'm going to return to the library today. So, so. But uh, let me sh show you a couple of basic definitions in this theory. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure there are many different ways, but the way I think about why, so somebody gives me this polynomial and why do I think it's not in the limit? I'm secretly thinking of this condition here.
So what I'm going to later show you is that anything in the boundary satisfies a much stronger signature condition than what was naively imposed. And in particular, if you look at the Hessian of this guy, then in fact it has two positive eigenvalues, which violates the formal Hodge theory that I have in the back of my mind. And yeah, that is essentially the reason why this is not in there. Yeah, the Hessian is uh, diagonal, so positive or thing. Okay. So this is a really a full-blown theory, but the most basic part of the, its definition is the definition of a convex set. So suppose you have a subset of n to the n. I mean, to us, we can think of this J as a set of monomials that appear in the polynomial expression of f, but this is a general definition. So J is said to be m convex if the following condition is satisfied. So the condition is that for every alpha and beta in J, And for every index i inside n, so one of the coordinates with a property that ith coordinate of alpha is larger than the ith coordinate of beta. So that's my notation for the ith coordinates. So those are vectors, those are integers. You want to have another index j with a property that the j's coordinate of alpha is smaller than j's coordinate of beta. And alpha minus ei plus ej. So ei will be the ith standard unit vector in n to the n. Same for ej. You want this to be in J and beta minus EJ plus EI is also in J. So that's the condition. So what's happening here that lots of quantifiers here. So it is that if you look at the i-th direction and the j-th direction and maybe your alpha is somewhere here and beta is somewhere there so that the i-th coordinate of alpha is larger than the i-th coordinate of beta and if your both alpha and beta are in j then the condition is that if you drag alpha toward the direction of beta and drag beta to the direction of alpha then the new pair of points should be again in your set j And these are sort of standard examples of convex sets. So if G is a connected graph with N labeled edges, and if you take your J to be the set of all spanning trees, and view it as a subset of n to the n, then this is convex. Zero one vectors. Zero one vectors. So you see what I'm doing? So I have n edges. They correspond to n different directions. And if I have a, some subset of edges, maybe a spanning tree, I add all of them to get a zero one vector. Collect all of them, then it, this is a convex set, meaning that it has this condition. And the uh, second example is if I have a A, which is a collection of n-labeled vectors 
in some field. And if I collect all the bases of f to the v in A, then this is a convex set. And these are, of course, special cases of this matroid theory. So when you have a so-called matroid on n element set, and if you take J to be the basis, of M, then you have a convex set. So my understanding is that this M stands for matroids. And how much more general is this than this example? So this combinatorial example only concerns 0, 1 vectors. If you, yeah, so family of sets, 0, 1 vectors. But in order to develop the, like, uh, analytic theory, sometimes Rather than using this sort of a combinatorial set family point of view, just this uh, more geometric point of view is much more convenient and maybe essential. So in particular, maybe that uh, you know, the uh, monomials in uh, hyperbolic polynomials are also satisfying this? Uh, yes, yes. Of course, the most, most basic, I mean, from our point of view, the most fundamental example of a convex set is not of this type. So you should think of this as the most basic example. So look at all the vectors whose coordinate sum is equal to d. This is certainly not a 0, 1 vector, but this is the most basic example of a convex set that obviously has this property. If you think of these as the possible supports of a polynomial that appears in the limit, there, there are lots of like zeros, zeros here. So this is a this is the full support. This is the support of a homogeneous form that has all positive coefficients. And lots of holes in here. So these are all the examples that you see on the boundary. So, so you, you will get to this point. And Following these uh, non zero one vectors is also natural in the following sense. So maybe make a quick remark. If you think this, uh, so this is a hard earned definition. And if you never seen it before, you may think it's quite crazy, but uh, it is in a sense uh, really the correct definition. So. The point is that if you, of course, any notion of convex set in the discrete setting should have the property that if you take the convex hull in the usual sense, then a convex set should be the set of all integral points in its convex hull. But the, my understanding is that from algorithmic and many other purposes, this condition is not sufficient. You need a little bit more than that. And which is this property. But uh, so one implication that you can prove is that if you have this property, so-called symmetric exchange property from a matroid point of view, then you have uh, this usual convexity. Any set J which has this property must be the set of all integer points on some polyhedron but not any polyhedron, a very special kind of polyhedron. And maybe I'll tell you what those polyhedrons are. So, so there is a, another way of uh, describing convex sets in this discrete convex analysis. So suppose you have a Boolean lattice and maybe you have uh, some integer valued function. 
and maybe normalized in such a way that MC set has value zero and the entire set has finite value. And suppose this is submodular. So row S1, row S2 should be bigger than row S1 intersection S2 plus row S1 union S2 for all S1 and S2. And you can think of the so-called the base polyhedron. So of rho, which is a subset of vectors in R n, with a property that x of s is at most rho of s, or all s in n and x of n is equal to rho of n whereby x of s I mean the sum of all the xi's where i is in s so consistent with this <coughs> use of subscript And then you can take the, all the lattice points here. Oh. And essentially, this is a one to one correspondence. So if you give me submodular function, I look at the base polyhedron, then the integer points must satisfy the exchange property. Conversely, any convex set must be of this form or essentially unique submodular functional row. So, so this is a, a, one geometric way of thinking about submodular functions, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so later we're going to talk about convex functions, not just convex sets. That comes into play. So the Boolean hypercube itself is not convex, right? Yes. But uh, it's a projection of a convex set. So people talk about M natural convexity. So, on. so there is a hidden homogeneity here. So one observation is that whenever you have this condition, every member of your set J should have the same cardinality. So sum of the yeah, sum of this. So that's why this uh, discrete simplex delta dn, that's the most basic example. Use another symbol, MDN. So this will be again a subset of polynomials. So this will be a set of polynomials in HDN with a property that the support of F, a subset of N to the N. So a set of monomials that appear in the expression for F is M convex. So that's my condition.
So it's a funny set, it's neither open nor closed. And I'm going to write L2n. So I'm st again starting from the case d equals 2 as a set of quadratic forms with non negative coefficients. that have at most one positive eigenvalue. So this is a closed set because I'm imposing only closed conditions. And L of a dn are going to write by the set of all polynomials in MDN. So now the support is required to be M convex with a property that the ith derivative of F is in L to the D minus one N. So again, this looks like a recursive definition but one easy lemma that you can check is that if your support of f is m convex, then it's necessary that the support of the partial derivatives are m convex. So this is really again a condition, in addition to the condition on the original support, it's just a condition on the quadratic. So, so this is the same as saying that f in mdn with a property that if you take d minus 2 partial derivatives in any way, then it's in L2n. And the uh, basic observation is that this is the right set. So LDN is the closure of L of DN. So LDN is the exactly the set of Lorentzian polynomials. But on the surface of it, it's not even clear why this guy is a closed set. Because the condition that was required is not necessarily. So. so there is a funny interaction between the signature condition and the condition on the support. So here's the picture. So P of a, if I look at this set in the projective space, or the look at the space of Lorentzian polynomials, and you can write it as a disjoint union according to the possible supports. So let me just write it like this, where Lj is the Lorentzian with support J. And the disjoint union is over J. Subset of say delta t to the n. And another statement that you can prove is that this set is compact, well, because it's closed, and it's contractible. And it has contractible interior. P L not the end. So it looks very much like a ball. But it's not a really a convex ball.
That's right. So where? Uh, so that guy is erased. Oh, oh here it is. Here it is. So. So that's my set. Here's my w1 to the cube. Here's my w to the cube. Nothing here. Nothing here. If I take alpha, beta, then the exchange action forces me to have these two guys in the support, which is not. So this set is in no way convex, but it's contractible. That was my claim. So how do I know this? The, the one of the very nice features of this theory, which makes it very easy to work with, is that this whole space admits a very large semi-group action. So there's very large class of linear operators, probably one of any one of your favorite operators on polynomials will preserve the space of polynomials if it preserves some notion of positivity. So, and this can be used to show that it's contractible, but the, just the, having this large semi-group action is useful to verify that certain specific polynomial is Lorentzian. And the theorem continued. And if you write it, write the boundary in this way, then this LJ is non-empty if and only if J is m-convex. And in this case, Again, each one of these PLJs, little pieces, is contractible. So its deformation retracts to a distinguished point. So I'm going to tell you about this distinguished point later. And if you're just interested in combinatorics of set systems, then you can restrict the whole theory to uh, the set of multi-affine polynomials. So I'm going to write underline whenever I'm having in mind multi-affine polynomials. And by multi-affine, I mean its degree with respect to any one of the variables is at most one. So it's a sum of scale-free monomials. And it can be Lorentzian or not Lorentzian. So this entire set lives on the boundary of the space of Lorentzian polynomials. But of course, you can write it as a disjoint union. Let me write it this way this time where your M is a rank D matroid on M. So matroid is just another name for M convex set where it consists of zero one vectors. And it has the same property. So it is compact and contractible. And there is a one piece for every single one of rank D matroid on N, every single one of them is non-empty and contractible. Oh. So this is the, this ball-like picture that I have in mind. Oh. 
And this is a picture that's sort of uh, surprising from an algebraic geometer. Uh, so you, you define these sets by some smooth analytic condition for the interior. And there is really not much combinatorics going on in the interior. But if you take the closure of this set, then you suddenly get a very interesting discrete structure in the limit. So what happens is that if you take the closure, then the boundary can be expressed as a disjoint union of pieces. And each piece is again like ball-like. They are contractible subsets. And each one has a distinguished point lying on it. And the part that's interesting is that you see all of these convex sets, or, or all the matroids. So you don't discriminate those matroids that are not realizable over certain fields, or etc. So in this boundary, you see all of your like a favorite graph, maybe K4. And here, you, know, you see all of your favorite configurations, like the Fano configurations. And maybe some non-realizable ones like the Papus. Non-Papus, etc. So of course you have to match your D and N, but those can be achieved essentially by adding, adding loops and co-loops. So you see all these things in a single ball-like object. So it's a little bit like a soccer ball where you see a discrete pattern on the boundary of a smooth ball-like object. But it's much more. Yes, these distinguished points. Yeah. yeah. And from the point of this. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's just generating function for your set system, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And there's this large semi group action attracts every point in this piece to that distinguished point. <coughs> Uh, no, 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 it's the same here. So, so you, you can, so every one of M convex sets up here. So M convex subset of this dis discrete simplex. So the M convex subsets in, in, in terms of zero one are the matroids? Yes, yes, yes. I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so, but one thing that seems to be, uh, uh make this uh, study of Lorentzian polynomials useful is that this class of polynomials satisfy a very strong like a spectral condition that is not apparent from the definition. And this is what was used in some of the recent works in, uh, uh, by CS people like Anari and Oveis Garan and Vincent. So briefly put, this is what I call hodge riemann relations. For Lorentzian polynomials. And the statement is this. The Hessian of any non zero Lorentzian polynomial has exactly one positive eigenvalue.
on the positive portent. So this is an analog of the property that gives the log concavity of the volume polynomial on the ample cone. And what is interesting, so, so this implication is modeled on, of course, on the situation for algebraic geometry. And the basic intuition shared by almost all the people who work on the cohomology of algebraic varieties is that all the interesting action happens in exact middle of your cohomology. So if you're interested in what's happening in the, say, for hyperplane sections of a cohomology of algebraic variety, then it means that no matter what your dimension of the variety is, you're really looking at the case of surfaces because that is the case when the divisors become middle cohomology classes. So that's analogous to what's happening here. Oh. So this two here tells me that I'm really looking at, formally speaking, surfaces, algebraic surfaces. And this Lorentzian signature condition is what algebraic geometers call Hodge index theorem. And the point is that you can just use Hodge index theorem for surfaces to prove something about general dimensional varieties or polynomials. So if you go back to the definition of Lorentzian polynomials, the condition is essentially under quadratics. But you can just use them to prove something about the signature of the Hessian on any point on the positive orthant. And combinatorial people are mostly interested in the signature at the point 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which is far from the boundary. So it should have exactly one positive eigenvalue. So it's, the statement is really about the second largest eigenvalue, which should be non-positive. And you can use this to show that Lorentzian polynomials can be defined in different ways. And in fact, agrees with one of the classes of polynomials that was already introduced. Gervitz say. Gervitz says if you have a polynomial with non-negative coefficients in the n variables, and that's strongly low concave, if for every alpha in n to the n. The alpha's partial derivative is either identically zero or if not, the log of that thing is concave on the positive orthogonal. I hope it's clear what I mean by alpha's partial derivative. So alpha is a vector with alpha 1, comma alpha 2, dot, dot, dot. I'm taking the first partial derivative alpha 1 times, second partial derivative alpha 2 times, etc. And there's even stronger condition introduced by Anari et al. They say that such f is completely low concave if
for all m and uh, n by n matrix, m by n matrix a i j with non negative entries the partial derivative f i equals 1 to the n is identically 0 or log concave on the positive orthant where di is the directional derivative aij partial j j equals 1 to the j. So any completely low concave polynomial is strongly low concave. And the theorem is that these are all the same. For homogeneous polynomials. So one F is Lorentzian. F is completely low concave. And three, F is totally low concave. Strongly. Strongly. Point is that this in, in, in concrete situations, it's actually pretty tricky to prove that your polynomial belongs to these classes. It's usually extremely easy to check the condition 1. And if you use this description, some properties of these classes that's not so obvious is actually very easy to prove. For example, Gervis have asked whether the product of two strongly low concave polynomials is strongly low concave. Well, it sounds like a calculus question, but it's in fact rather tricky to prove. But it's quite easy exercise to prove that product of two Lorentzian is Lorentzian. So F1, F2 strongly low concave <coughs> implies F1 times F2 strongly low concave. Say for homogeneous polynomials F1 and F2. So if you are in combinatorics in the say univariate case, this is essentially the statement that if you have two ultra long concave sequence, then the convolution product is again ultra long concave. I mean, even this case was not so easy. This was used to be a conjecture of Pimentel and proved by Ligget. Uh, it's a particular case of this in when there is essentially one variable to consider. So, of course, I promised you that there, there is a strong connection between 
continuous convex analysis and discrete convex analysis. And any sort of a discrete convex analysis will be incomplete without mentioning functions. So, so far we have talked about convex sets in the discrete setting, but uh, there is a natural place for convex functions in this theory. Uh, so let me tell you briefly about that. So, so in this discrete convex analysis in the sense of Morota, you are looking at functions on n to the n. Again, think of the set of monomials in n variables. And the value of your function takes, can be real number or infinite. Just any such function. And whenever you have any one such, you associate a set, domain of V. It's so something called the effective domain of of mu, and it's the set of all alphas where your function is finite. So very much like the usual convex analysis. And you say that such function is m convex. If every alpha and beta in the effective domain of u and any i one of the indices where i -th coordinate of alpha is larger than the i -th coordinate of beta so same starting line as the m convex set the property you want is that there is another index j with the property that the j's coordinate of alpha is less than j's coordinate of beta, such that new alpha plus new beta is larger than new of a alpha minus ei plus ej plus new of a beta minus ej plus ei. So one thing that you see from here is that the effective domain of any m convex function must be m convex. If that's finite, finite, then these two should be finite. <coughs> of course, the most basic example of such a function is coming from sets. So if you have a m convex set, j, then the function nu defined by setting nu alpha equal to either 0 or infinity depending on whether your alpha is in j or not is m convex but of course there are a lot more interesting m convex functions To me, uh, the canonical example that I always have in mind is the so-called tropical linear spaces. Whatever it is, it is the same thing as what people call valuated matroid. And to be really precise, in this language, 
evaluated matroid is the same thing as m concave function, not convex. Taking values in r or minus infinity, whose effective domain is in the set of 0, 1 vectors. And the theorem is that the following conditions are equivalent for any, any function new on n to the n. And the first condition is that mu is m convex. And I'm going to tell you some other conditions in terms of Lorentzian polynomials. And two, the polynomial constructed from mu that has an extra parameter, real parameter, q, in n variables w, so w stands for w1, w2, dot, 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 which is by definition the sum over all points in the effective domain of mu and the coefficient corresponding to alpha is q to the new alpha and you have alpha factorial and w to the alpha And the statement is that this is Lorentzian. For all positive q at most 1. So again, I'm hoping that alpha factorial makes sense to you. It's the product of the factorials of the coefficients. And w alpha is the monomial corresponding to alpha. So discrete convex function sort of controls the Lorentzian property for families so how it degenerates and to me the statement that is informative is a version of two uh, and it goes something like there is a Lorentzian polynomial over k. So this is the field of real Fougeot series. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this later. Whose so tropicalization is new. So 1, 2, 3 are equivalent. So if you're not comfortable with 3, just stick to 2. It's a completely classical statement. Yes, if it's if nu is m convex, because domain of nu is then m convex set, which is by exchange axiom should be. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, so. And this, this equivalence is a powerful statement. So just think of a very special m-convex functions, which is of this form, just m-convex sets. Then the value is either 0 or infinite. So the polynomial in question has nothing to do with q. 
because anything to the zeroth power is one. So in that case, the polynomial in question is simply the sum over all the points in the domain. In if your domain is just a zero one set, it's just a generating function or partition function for your m convex set system. So, so the corollary is that J is m convex if and only if its generating function, so normalized by alpha factorial, which is 1 anyway if you're looking at set system, is Lorentzian. So of course, for most people, the, this direction of the implication is most interesting. So if you start with any graph or matroid, you look at sum over all bases or spanning trees, that's got to be Lorentzian. And particularly, it's Hessian at the, any point in the positive orthant has a particular spectrum. And again, there, there's another sort of a statement that you can extract out of this that has nothing to do with Q, for example. So, so you can use this to show that if you have any polynomial, let's just write it in this normalized fashion. So alpha is in the support of F. And just let me just refer to this C alpha as the normalized coefficient of f. And you see that this, this Lorentzian if this, uh, this function, discrete function that maps alpha to the natural logarithm of the no normalized coefficient C alpha is m concave. So here I'm just using the one implication from 1 to 2. And I'm evaluating q equals e, which is larger than 1, which is why I replace m convex to m concave here. So of course, uh, the, the other implication really fails. So to get the other implication, you need the whole family, and especially the behavior near q equals 0. None, none, well, you... none. It's interesting. Usually, if you have a equipped, you want to say that one and two are equivalent. One of the two implications is easy. I don't think that's the case here in any of the equivalents that I stated. Yeah, but I was going to ask uh, maybe a somewhat different question. Where do, where do, uh, where do you use the algebraic geometry? And no, at no place. At no place. At no place. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this whole paper is an exercise in multivariable calculus. But uh, sometimes multivariable calculus can be difficult. And when it becomes difficult, what I do is I think of this again, this hypothetical situation where I have a projective variety and ample cone. And, and then people ask me in that setting, what would I do? And, and, and then this uh, somehow, it suggests some multivariable calculus techniques, and it always works. That, that's just the amazing experience that I had while carrying out this. So I, mean, I think that's, that's a part of like what, we, what we keep as a community. So sometimes there is a, there's no theorem or anything, but there are some unwritten like a set of experiences shared among certain group of mathematicians. And, and in particular, I'm having in mind this uh, work of uh, the Cataldo and Migliorini on this, uh, this uh, Hodge theory, how to prove this, uh, all the basic theorems of Hodge theories by building up from the scratch. And I, uh, if I rely on that intuition, there's, it always tells us 
what multivariable calculus trick you need to perform. And that works. I think Cheyenne will tell us yeah, yeah, the, yeah, in yeah, the following the, week. Some, yes. Yeah, yes. If there's no. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So again, concerning this statement three, what I'm roughly talking about is this. Well, I can tell you exactly. So I, I'm, the, there's no need to know any of the fancy tropical geometry or anything. So the concrete statement that I'm saying in the statement three is to consider the following field. So. This is a field of, so each one of this individual field is a field of Laurent series in the variable t to the 1 over k. So that has, let's say, some positive radius convergence around 0. And you look at the union of all these things. So any element, st, is of the form c1 to the ta1 c2 to the ta2 dot 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 and it converges somewhere near zero where each ci is a non-zero real number and a i is an increasing sequence of rational numbers with common denominator So those are generic elements of this K. And you say that an element in K is positive if C1 is positive. So this guy is called the leading coefficient of S. And A1 is called the leading exponent of F. And the assertion that's made here is that the Lorentzian behavior only depends on the leading exponent of the coefficients. So formally speaking, leading coefficient, leading exponent, and the process of tropicalization is simply taking the valuation of st, which is by definition the leading exponent when it's non-zero, st is non-zero, which is this sort of a logarithmic limit. where t approaches 0 from the positive side. So fancy people call this Maslow dequantization. So it's, but it is up very nicely. So this is a process somehow that smoothly deforms this uh, addition operation, to multiplication, and the, there's a, like a max operation which replaces the addition. And the tropicalization of f with coefficients in k is simply the function which maps alpha to the valuation or leading exponent of the coefficient. 
So that's the statement three. What's nice is that this field k is real closed field. So for all purposes, it's like the real number. So anything that you can prove over the real numbers is going to probably be true over k when it's expressible in first order sentence. So for example, a statement like f is Lorentzian if and only if it's strongly low concave if and only if it's completely low concave. This is in fact the first order sentence in the language of real field, so it's also true, the equivalence is also true in K. So the point is that this, if you express things over K, essentially you're having in mind that parameter Q or T in the mind, and then you're really looking at the region where Q is very small. And then you can honestly think about the function which is obtained by evaluating that Q on that small radius of convergence. And the statement is that such and such functions are low concave on positive orthant and so on. Okay. So let me close up uh, one of the with uh, one of the very useful technical property of this space, um, which makes it very pleasant to work with. So Pater is, I told you that Pater is thinking of this whole theory as an extension of the theory of stable polynomials. And one of the seminal work Pater did with uh, Borchia is that uh, he classified all the linear operators that preserve the stability of polynomials in terms of what is called a symbol. And we ha have Lorentzian analog of that theorem. So I'm not going to tell you the statement because then I have to go through the symbol and then other technical setup. But one very useful consequence of our Lorentzian analog of this characterization of stability preservers is the following. So before giving you the statement, I'll tell you the argument. What is Pater theorem with uh, Borchia? Um, he associates to any linear operator acting on the polynomial space a symbol. It's uh, another polynomial with more variable, maybe. And the statement is that the original operator preserves stable polynomials exactly when its symbol is stable. And what we can prove is that if you have an operator um, acting on the polynomial space, and if your operator preserved like homogeneous polynomials, non-negative coefficient, and Lorentzian property, uh, this is implied by the symbol being Lorentzian. So combining the two statements, you immediately see that any one of your operators that you already know is preserving stability is going to preserve Lorentzian property. So all this partial symmetrization process and so on and so on that's already known to be uh, stability preservers and this part of this yoga of this whole industry of this stability stable polynomial, they, they all preserve Lorentzian polynomials. And you're, if you have a, your favorite technique, work on that, it will going to work here in the same way. So the corollary is that any homogeneous linear operator. So mapping homogeneous polynomials to homogeneous polynomial that preserves stable polynomials and polynomials with non-negative coefficients Preserves Lorentzian polynomials. No, they are not all. So the other direction is just not true.
So here's the picture that we have described so far. So I have uh, I've started with this open set of strictly Lorentzian polynomials. And I have told you that some very interesting discrete structure appears on the boundary. So this is my, my favorite ball-like object that's contractible with contractible interior. And this is uh, another one of examples of the phenomenon that in the limit discrete structures tend to appear. So in the interior there was no combinatoric set all. So in the boundary you have uh, this contractible patches splitting up the boundary. Each one has a distinguished point on it which is partition function or generating function. And maybe next week I'm going to tell you about some specific members like a partition function appearing in statistical physics and tell you some consequence of them being Lorentzian. So there's a large chunk of this space is occupied by stable polynomials. An even larger chunk is occupied by volume polynomials, uh, say, of, say of convex bodies. So if, you have, if you're given n convex bodies, you can take a Minkowski linear combination of them and take the volume of the Minkowski sum and then you get a polynomial with non-negative coefficients and these are examples of Lorentzian polynomials. So certainly they don't ex exhaust this whole thing. And maybe we have volume polynomials of projective varieties. So I don't think there's any, yeah, not much algebraic geometry in the audience, but uh, if you apply this theory to the case of original case of volume polynomials of projective varieties, you get some interesting geometric fact, which is the support of your volume polynomial projective variety must be m convex in the sense of discrete analysis. It's a completely geometric statement, but I don't think it's people have people are aware of this. Uh, but uh, you get lots of these points and so on, and there are lots of uh, specific members of this, like uh, so the or POTS model partition functions. Or characteristic polynomials of so-called M matrices also live on the boundary and so on. So the, the point I want to make is that once you have a reasonable conjecture, such and such polynomial should be Lorentzian. It's just very easy to prove. Well, you have to compute the signature of one matrix at some point, but usually most of the part is taken care of by induction because the partial derivative of your polynomial is hopefully a polynomial of the same kind. So there is usually just a one computation you need to perform. And I suspect there are lots and lots more interesting members. And most of them will live on the boundary. It's a little bit like Australia. So most of the population <laughs> is will be here. So. And concerning the equivalent 3, for example, if you look at the space of multi-affine Lorentzian polynomials over this Peugeot series field K, then you can tropicalize the whole picture, this whole set. And then it becomes a very familiar object to tropical geometers. Then it becomes what is called the Dressian. And many people have studied this set. And it's a beautiful set. It's a tropical variety, and it's the most basic example of what geometers call moduli space. So this is a set of, or moduli space, of all d-dimensional tropical linear space in n space. And it's a polyhedral fan. 
for example, if you look at the case d equals 2 and n equals 5, this fan is essentially the Patterson graph. or a cone over it to make it a fan and lives in all 10 which is 5 choose 2 and it has some linearity space so it's a two-dimensional fan or a cone over a graph plus a four-dimensional linearity space but it is what it is so it's and in the, if you increase your d and n it becomes larger and larger and one of the things that have puzzled tropical geometers for some time is that Dressian is supposed to be the tropicalization of the Grassmannian, except it's not. So tropicalized linear spaces are occupy a very small portion of tropical linear spaces. So again, there is realizability issue here. But if you work with this Florentian polynomial, all these goes away. So these have uniform behaviors. And the fact that this is a interesting polyhedral, well, tropical variety, like visibly tells you why or when you can add two tropic Lorentzian polynomials to get Lorentzian polynomials. So each one of these cones is a convex cone, but they meet each other in an interesting way. And when you can add them to still belong to the same space depends on the really this uh, delicate combinatorics of this tropical variety. So It's a fan. So it's a cone over a simplicial complex. Yeah. When d equals 2 and n equals 5, that simplicial complex is a graph. So, yeah. Maybe I'll stop here and continue next week with some more specific examples of Lorentzian polynomials and just some uh, guide to how to work with them. <laughs>